there probably isn't a more loyal fan base for a horror film than Texas Chainsaw. This was hard work in the hot sun, long days. It takes its toll on you. It just was a very raw, carnal kind of experience. You guys are sick. You guys are sick. Don't you have any conscience? Where I think it came from is 1973. There were a bunch of hippies hanging out right smack dab in the middle of Texas. You know, really there were two sides. There were the hippies and there were the rednecks. In our mind, the whole world was divided up into those two. There's them that laughs and knows better. We were convinced that if we were traveling from one city to another, if our car broke down, that would be the last anybody would see of us. A hundred years before, everything in a small town would have been considered pure and everything in the city would be corrupt. It's the Hansel and Gretel story of where they're led deeper and deeper into the woods and then they're baked. <laughs> Only in this case, they're barbecued. I got some good barbecue here. Toby Hooper was the director of the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre and he co-wrote it with another guy named Kim Hinkle. He had shot quite a few industrial films himself. He had done one feature film, a film called Eggshells. He was in a department store one day, waiting in a long line during a Christmas shopping rush, and was going insane, being caught up in this mass of humanity, and was wound up standing next to a bunch of chainsaws that were on sale, and had this fantasy of, boy, wouldn't it be great if I could just mow all these people down and get to the line faster, and suddenly thought, wow, there's an idea for a horror film. Toby rang me up and said, listen, I've got this film I'm doing. I really want a Texan to shoot this for me, and, uh, I reckon you're the best cameraman in the state of Texas. So he, he sent me the script, I read it, it was incredible. I mean, the hair stood up on the back of my neck. I had hairs then. The film was originally undertaken with a projected $80,000 budget. It blows your mind finding how they did so much with so little. It looks like it's shot with a documentary camera. Toby has said that he wanted to shoot this handheld cinema verite. He wanted a shooting style that could be fluid like that. It could get in tight places and you know, have that organic feeling to it. There are images in there that are just so real and raw. It's almost like a snuff film. You feel this is really happening and these people are really dying. <laughs> The advertising campaign was so lurid, indicating that this was something that really happened. The original Texas Chainsaw Massacre was inspired by the life of Ed Gein, a serial killer in Wisconsin. A guy with a wide range of very unsavory interests. You know, he was a grave robber, necrophiliac. The whole idea of making a mask out of somebody else's face clearly inspired Sons of the Lambs and Psycho alike, and ultimately the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. This film is positively ruthless in its attempt to drive you right out of your mind. It was relentless and absolutely unapologetic. This is the movie Rex Reed called the most horrifying motion picture I have ever seen. Just people screaming and running away from this guy wielding a chainsaw. You're watching it and you're thinking, oh my God, I might be in the hands of a madman. It was really disturbing. And I mean that in a good way. It was so effective and completely freaking people out. Ooh, I just don't want to look. There's a certain reverence that goes with it. Death is not just a big joke. It finds its roots in reality, which is always the biggest horror of all. After you stop screaming, you'll start talking about it. They made a distribution deal with Bryanston. Bryanston was a distribution company that was pretty big in terms of low budget films. His previous successes had been uh, quite eye-opening as well. They had Deep Throat, the Warhol's Frankenstein. These fellas knew their business and knew how to collect what was owed them. Bryanston gave us a quarter of a million dollars cash up front. Oh my God, this film thing, it works. This hadn't even hit the screen yet. We're in the black. Texas Chainsaw Massacre may be the most successful independent film in history. Nobody will ever know exactly how much money it made because most of the money was siphoned off by the mafia guys who owned Bryanston Pictures. Some of the executives were Italian, some were deported. If we transpose those 1974 dollars, that would make it a number one film even today. 25 years later, members of Congress were still using the Texas Chainsaw Massacre as an example of the depravity of America. I just can't take no pleasure in killing. If they were going to say, this is what's wrong with America, they would say, films like that Texas Chainsaw Massacre.
I've heard all the rumors about the remake, and it, oh boy, I'm not looking forward to it. How do you remake a movie that like has so much history behind it, so such a fan base? Will it stand up to you know the original? The movie's so right the way it is. I don't know why they should, you know, like, why? I'm sure it's gonna suck. I'm sorry. Yeah. A location is the Hewitt residence um, on Route 17. It's where victim one was found. When we decided to make this movie, we were determined not to make a campy horror film. I felt it was time to go back to the old school horror movie. And that means raw and real and not a single joke. The goal of the company was to do small movies where the movie would be the star. Michael is known for making movies at a much higher budget level, and the idea behind Platinum Dunes was to make movies under the $20 million budget range, keeping them high concept and commercial, just not spending $100 million on them. I started from music videos where I had no money, so I'm used to that guerrilla filmmaking technique, and I know it can be done. So we started looking into different films, and, and the rights to Texas Chainsaw Massacre became available. Mike Fleiss is a reality producer. Six or seven years ago, he started building up his relationship with Kim Hinkle and Toby Hooper and convinced them that he was the guy to remake the movie. When I told him about the company, he said, well, take it to those guys, see what they think about it. And suddenly, this little $3 million movie became a much bigger movie. Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a title that is now revered as a classic. And what I kept finding is everyone thought this was true. This was the hook. The hook was, we're going to make this a true story. For 30 years, the files collected dust. When we started looking for writers for this film, it was important to us that we found a writer who had the respect for the original and still had a fresh enough take. So we met with the writer, Scott Kozar. He has a very twisted mind. One of the initial ideas I had was, you know, regarding the hitchhiker scene. They take the head and they boil it, except for the tongue. There was no way to improve upon the hitchhiker in the first movie because you just can't cast that, <laughs> you know? It was done the first time and I just knew you couldn't try to replicate that. Hey, are you okay? So I came up with a different scenario. You're all gonna die. Grab, grab it. Oh. <laughs> it's always how do you get the kids in the town? That's the problem with all these horror movies. What is the reason why? I just thought it would really be dramatic if these five kids are crossing the panhandle and 10 minutes into the movie, they've got this headless corpse in the back of the van. And what are they going to do about it? Well, I'll tell you this much. There's no possible way I'm ever getting back in that van. I had this crazy idea to record a girl in a house. Totally black, big movie theater, amazing STDS sound. You hear her running around the theater clamoring up these wood stairs. She comes to the front of the screen, you can't see anything. She opens like this closet door and you hear her barricading stuff and dragging stuff in front of the door. And then you hear male footsteps. And you hear her breathing, trying to be quiet as you hear these footsteps come up and around the theater. And then you hear this guy right in front of the door. And then there's four seconds of just dead silence. Everyone in the audience would jump and then they would laugh because they got scared. How did I get scared from just hearing sound? That's when we showed around. We showed it at AFM. We sold the movie internationally. Then we met domestic studios out here. We're going to let you listen to this. Then we had bidders and we sold the movie that day. We sold the movie before there was a script, before a page was written. It's one of those rare days where you're in profit in a movie before you've ever written a page. We sold it to New Line. We always felt that New Line was a perfect company to release this movie because they are the best company out there for horror movies. We've always talked about New Line as being a manufacturer, if you will, of, of date movies. Couples go to the movies, everybody gets scared, the girl grabs the guy, the guy grabs the girl maybe for slightly different reasons. It's something that gets you to go back. Bob Shea was one of the original distributors after the porno maven distributed the movie. This was one of our birthrights in a euphemistic sense. I felt a little bit uh, that kind of like weird synchronicity. I always knew that I wanted to make my first movie with New Line and somehow it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. I know that this movie could not have been done at just any studio. And action. There's always a rumor that Michael was going to direct this movie and I wanted to spell that because Michael never was going to direct this movie. There were rumors that I considered directing it myself. No, I, I didn't. There were scenes I would have liked to direct. 
the concept of the company was always to find interesting directors who have a great sense of style who have not done a movie before. Which would always lead us into the world of commercial video directors. We spent months looking at director's reels. An agent from CIA called up and said Marcus Nispel would be interested. And I'm like, he's great. Um, I, I know Marcus. We should have him in. When we saw his reel, it was unbelievable. I mean, the reel truly was heads and tails above everything else that we had seen. I started working in advertising agencies when I was 15. Then I came to America on a Fulbright scholarship. I wanted to get more into film. I winded up for a company that advertised movies. That's how I got into that world. The first stuff was the music videos. The best way to sort of break into directing is doing music videos. Not only is it sort of an easy place to crack, but it's also a great place to grow and to experiment. I did 250 different ones, you know, anything from Puff Daddy to Aretha Franklin to Tony Bennett. Advertising started to borrow a lot from music videos. So I did music videos that wanted to look like movies and I did commercials that wanted to look like music videos. So the big question was always, what would be my first movie like? He came in and really blew us away by making a presentation which comprised of a thousand photographs and told us how the movie was going to look and what it was going to feel like in the way that we had been describing it amongst ourselves. If I look at the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, those movies have been done. You can't do them in the same way again. You know audiences think they know what will happen and then you surprise them by not doing that. I think that is the only reason to make a remake. Michael, from the get-go, said this is the guy who's going to make this movie so much more. Like Jerry Bruckheimer, who found Michael Bay when he was relatively unknown and gave him a chance, that's what Michael Bay is doing with Marcus. It was my desire to create a company to help younger directors break into feature films. Commercial directors, sometimes there's this, the ad agency against the director. There's a big difference when you go to the feature world. It is a teamwork to get that movie made and to make it good. And I was trying to feed all my information that I learned in my movies to him. So that's a Michael Bay. We're talking about a fusion of different industries of different styles of filmmaking. Michael actually pioneered this whole idea of taking the best of both worlds and sort of like juggling it all. There's some areas where I just knew he would understand the merit of working with people that I work with every day that I have wireless communication with. I thought you got tighter on mine. You have a tighter lens? Yeah. Zoom, zoom in on that camera, please. The cinematographer is Daniel Pearl. He DP'd the original one. This is of sorts of homecoming. He's also a really good friend of mine. It turned out that Daniel was Marcus's main DP in his commercial video world. Pretty much any commercial music video that I have on my reel, he shot. Marcus called me up. He said, listen, Daniel, I just signed to do the remake of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Will you do it with me? And without even thinking, I immediately said yes. All the bloodying and all the fencing and all the breaking through chain link. I'm not going to do that tomorrow. Ah, I love working with him. He's a great friend of mine. So I sort of just said yes, then I went, well, Wait a second, what did I just do? And I hung up the phone. I said, I always told everybody I wouldn't do this film again. And without even a moment's hesitation, I said yes. So it's a fascination that I have with him. He's just an incredible man to work with. The films just always come out good. I thought it was very important, and I think it's somehow expected by the diehard fans to somehow, you know, kiss a ring. John LaRoquette, thank God, worked out. He did the narration of the first one. He did the narration here. Every time we got someone else to try to do it, it just didn't sound like John Larroquette. The events of that day were to lead to the discovery of one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The one single aspect that I'm the most proud of is the cast. We were looking for great actors, but we were also looking for compatibility. They got to look believable that they're all going from one place to the other, that they would be in this van together, and that they had a really good chemistry. It's like... Synchronicity. When we read the script, Scott Kozar had given a nice description to each character. I remember when he was describing Aaron, he said, she'd be Miss Texas if she wasn't such a tomboy. Big brothers. Well, Jessica basically grew up on television. She was on the show Seventh Heaven for seven years, so America basically watched her grow up. This is clearly such a departure. I can see why she would want to make this type of a movie, because you just have to break the spell of being a child actor. Action! Please, you've got to help him! This is fucking killing him! I love horror films. I've been interested in the genre ever since I was a kid. I love being scared and freaked out. Ah! 
I loved the script, and I was so excited to hear that Michael Bay was going to be a part of it, and also Marcus. Good. You know what? It was too much of a shock moment when you turned yeah, around. Go right away again. I had no doubt in my mind. I really wanted to be part of this movie. Okay, Morgan. Come on. Morgan, get up. You have a very strong, very, very intelligent woman that goes deep in her female energy, and every woman likes to see a woman that's a survivor, that's a hero, that is smart does something about it. Interesting enough, when they saw the movie, New Line said, man, nah, women aren't going to like this movie. And it was surprising that women went in droves to this movie. We were looking for a part of Kemper. He can't be just a polite guy or just a nice guy. You got to be a little bit of a shit. Kemp, can you do something about the AC back here? I'm melting. No. My wife was a huge Six Feet Under fan. She kept on pointing on Eric. And I went like, damn, you, you would be really good on what an edge. Keep your goddamn voice now. You always wanted to be in a horror movie that everyone was terrified of, so it's like kind of a dream come true. All right, that's it. If somebody's out there, just stop fucking around, all right? When he did audition, he had this sense of authority and leadership when he came in. Do you understand that we cannot drive around this town with a dead woman in the back of our van? The guy was fantastic. He's like the kind of guy you want to have at any dinner party you ever throw that just loosens things up. Regrettably, against popular belief, was the first one to get whacked in the head. He gets killed 20 minutes into the movie, but you don't think so because he comes in and he takes such command of the situation. The last thing you think is that that's going to be the first guy to go, and that's why he was the perfect guy to cast for the role. Jonathan Tucker plays Morgan. Morgan is the intellectual of the group. 33,000 Americans each day are infected with a sexually transmitted disease, and two-thirds of them are just about your age. He has the unfortunate task of really knowing more than the other characters of what's going on. I think we should go, like, now, like right now. Jonathan Tucker is a guy who's been acting since he was a kid. He was in The Virgin Suicide. He did a movie called The Deep End. He's a very seasoned movie actor. A girl blew her head off in our car today. We lost um, our weed. Uh, you know, we're dicking around this. Pull on, go down. What I like that the stakes are really high. I've never played anything like this where your life is on the line. That's to me very interesting to play. But it was Marcus and the way he sees the world, which is so radically different from my own. I became an actor to work with people like him. Tucker was awesome. But he did not get the role. Marcus believed that his look was not what he was looking for. He has an angel face, you know? He can never be believable as a cynic, you know? He can act like one, but he doesn't look like one. What are we gonna do? I called him back and I said, look, maybe you have to transform yourself. You know, put the sideburns on to look a bit older. Try the glasses that Dreyfus wore in Jaws. And he sent me like this little VHS tape. I went like, he got the role, he got the part. And action. Is that where she was setting? Month later, he's sitting in a van with Arlie Ermey, and he's holding his own. In fact, Jonathan's idea was that when he gets the gun shoved into his mouth, that he would get so sick to the stomach that he would throw up. You motherfucker! Get the fucking floor! He made himself throw up every time we did the take. And we did 25 takes from different angles. Just to see him, this young actor, holding his ground was just like one of the best experiences of my life. Mike Vogel's part was what I thought would be the toughest to cast for. His role is that of the guy who always says the wrong thing at the exact wrong time to say it. I guess that's what brains look like. Huh? It's hard to make that guy likable. Sort of like uh, lasagna, kind of. God, he's a schmuck, and nobody's going to care if he ever dies. All right, I'll shut up now. He came in and read it, and I went like, you know, he's a schmuck, he thinks, but I still like him. When you bring an audience in mentally into something and get them to care about the characters, get them to care about what these guys are going through, oh, shit. Come on, come on. people would look at this and be like, oh, my word. Erica Learson plays Pepper. Pepper is the free spirit. The movie opens, she's well, making out with Andy. We didn't even know each other yesterday. Erica goes for it, whatever she's doing when she's acting. To speak to her, she's certainly not effusive. Am I ready? Yeah. I don't feel ready. But when she acts, she totally goes for it. <laughs> Why did she have to be? <laughs> she did acting for Woody Allen, which is always the number one verification. I had to go back and watch the original. When I saw that, it's somebody's fucking teeth, isn't it? Okay, this could be really, really scary. <laughs> and that's why I wanted to do it. Erin, find your goddamn boyfriend. It's time to go. Also, she was an incredible screamer. Ah! Oh my God! In the scene we auditioned her, 
is when Aaron is trying to hotwire the car. Louder, come on! It's coming! It's coming! Come on! Fuck! Marcus, in the middle of the audition, just wanted to get her to scream as loud and as hard as she could. Coming through the roof! We were actually auditioning actors at an office building. People above us and below must have been horrified to hear her screaming. She was screaming so loud. Let me out! 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 And literally, Marcus yells, cut. And she just sits back and starts giggling. You see this actress's level of commitment and then how quickly she can just turn it off. Look out! Lauren German, a tough role. She is not going to just do the visine. One, two, three. A consummate actress. She wanted to stay in that state even between takes. I just wanted to get done with her because it just seemed like I was torturing this poor thing. When we set up to make this movie, we also knew we had to change characters. We didn't want to make a movie that was basically the exact same movie they made in 1973. One of the easier things to change was the dynamics of the family. In the original film, Leatherface is the monster of the movie, but the entire family forms this sort of composite monster. I thought you was in a hurry! All these characters are the psychopath's alter egos. These are split personalities. They're just fragments of that split personality. I thought that was a really interesting notion. What's wrong with you fucking people? This movie should be populated with the kinds of characters that are so marginalized from society and just sort of live this frontier existence. And they should be the kinds of people that are so foreign to anyone who lives in a big city that the moment you see them, you know, your skin starts to crawl. Also, I think there's an element to people who were fans of the original. If we use the exact same characters, they would know what to expect from those characters. You kids shouldn't have messed with that little girl. Let's talk about Arlie. That's none of your goddamn business, faggot! He impressed everybody watching Full Metal Jacket. As soon as he gets on set, Vogel starts quoting Full Metal Jacket, and Lee at first is very reticent to start becoming that character, but after 15 minutes... That name sounds like royalty to me. Are you royalty, Private Dial? They're really neat kids. Do you suck dicks, Private Dial? <laughs> <laughs> we could not find a sheriff for the longest time. And Brad Fuller called me up and says, I think I could get Arlie Ermey. I'm like, book him if you can get him. Protect and serve, that's what we do. It was hard to find an actor who could make it feel creepy and scary and 